These mics right now, uh -huh. they're hot, they're on, so if you have anything you're going to discuss to anybody, you know, that's Thank when you turn them off. Thank you. Okay. Again, you know, so on. Good morning. Good morning. We're going to start in 30 seconds. So if everybody could grab their seat, we're going to begin today's uh, hearing in about 30 seconds. I don't think people heard me. I don't think so either. No. How much am I, is my mic on? Yeah, it's on. Good morning. Welcome to our Assembly uh, Blue Ribbon Commission on Early Childhood Education. We're here at Cerritos College. And first of all, I want to uh, thank Cerritos College for being our gracious host today. We'll hear from them in a, in a few seconds. Uh, again, this is the uh, Assembly Speaker Anthony Rendon's Blue Ribbon Commission on Early Childhood Education. This is an, an important topic, and this is our second hearing, so we're, we're glad to get out in the community uh, today. Our first hearing was up in Sacramento, and this is, again, our, our second hearing. We'll be hearing uh, these issues quarterly through the next year and a half, so it's really uh, a, an important issue that for California, for our youth, for our economic future, and certainly for education, and you all know that because you're here today. And I did want to note we will be uh, joined a little bit by our, our Speaker of the Assembly, Anthony Rendon. He's on his way. This is uh, his uh, alma mater, so I know he's really proud to come back to Cerritos College. Uh, today's hearing is going to be focused on two, to two topics. We're going to uh, first have an update on uh, ECE, child care and preschool issues from the state perspective and the state budget. We have a presenter uh, from the California Budget and Policy Center that's going to give us an update on the 2017-2018 California budget, but more importantly, not taking a look at this year's budget, but looking back in the past few years and seeing where we've been and where we're going and some of the uh, challenges and also some of the successes. As well, today we're going to be focusing on the issue of childhood brain development. As we know, early experiences for little ones can have uh, both positive and uh, negative impacts and lifelong consequences. Uh, we're really uh, focused on this on a national level. There's more and more discussion as far as the impacts of uh, toxic stress and the adverse childhood experiences and how that impacts our, our youngest learners and what we can do as far as early interventions to, to make improvements. Uh, this is a uh, robust uh, conversation we're going to start, and so we'll get right at it. And at the end, by the way, we will, if time permits, we will have public comments. So hopefully we'll get to that as well. Um, with that, we will, we will proceed uh, with the, uh, with the uh, commission today. I will note that the co-chair, Christina Garcia, is unable to attend. She has uh, family uh, medical issues to, to address with some of her family members, and so uh, the show goes on. We are joined by my other assembly legislative colleague, assembly member Blanca Rubio. So briefly, I just want to ask every commissioner if maybe they could uh, introduce themselves and tell us their affiliation. Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll start over here. Hi, Deborah Kong, Early Edge, California. Uh, uh, Anthony Rendon, Assembly Member, 63rd District. <laughs> Good morning, Sonia Campos Rivera with the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce. Good morning, Nina Boothy, California Child Development Administrators Association. Good morning, Tanya McMillan, Family Child Care Provider uh, in the City of Bellflower, the co-chair of Raising California Together Coalition, and the treasurer for SEIU Local 99. Good morning. I'm Mike Olnick from the Child Care Resource Center, serving northern Los Angeles County and San Bernardino County. And I'm Assemblymember Blanca Rubio, and I uh, represent the 48th Assembly District, which is north of, of Cerritos. That's the important part. Yes. Hi, Jacqueline McCroskey, USC School of Social Work, and I also serve on the LA County Commission on Children and Families. Thank you. And before we get to our host from Cerritos College, we are 
joined by our assembly speaker, Anthony Rendon, who maybe wants to say a, a, few, a few words. Thank you. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Ms. Garcia is, uh, represents the college in the assembly, but in her absence, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, try to offer uh, to be the host, given that I attended this community college for two years in the late 80s. I had my wallet stolen over there. <laughs> Fond memories. That doesn't happen anymore, right, Dr. Fierro? Never happens anymore. Um, but uh, a lot has changed, not only for me uh, since the uh, since the late 80s, since the late 80s, but uh, obviously for early childhood education. If you uh, look at the folks assembled here uh, on uh, uh, on the stage in front of you, you see someone like uh, Blanca Rubio, who spent a tremendous amount of time in the classroom. You see someone like Kevin McCarty, my colleague from Sacramento, who. Uh, was just a few three three short years ago advocating for early childhood education funding uh, in in Sacramento. It's actually how I met uh, Kevin for the first time. I got my start in politics because I was running a nonprofit less than five miles from here, whose funding had essentially been cut in half. It was an early childhood education organization that funded mostly uh, early Head Start, early Head Start, Head Start state preschool and uh, infants and toddlers. And it, for me, the, uh, the Blue Ribbon Commission is really an opportunity for those of us, uh, the, the folks here assembled here, but also our, our colleagues in the Senate who deserve some credit sometimes, like Holly Mitchell, for example, who preceded me in politics and who I met at a, at a, rally, on, o, o, at a rally on early childhood education probably in the, in the early 90s. The Blue Ribbon Commission is, again, an opportunity for us to uh, talk to different communities throughout the state. It's an opportunity for us to hear from different communities uh, throughout the state and to really get a sense of how you, the people of California, how you sort of contextualize early childhood education, not only within your communities, not only within the various settings uh, in which you, you work and interact with our communities, but also the extent to which you think early childhood education should be uh, uh, placed within the, the broader context of California politics. Uh, two years ago, we were very proud as a legislature to allocate in, in excess of $500 million for early childhood education as a state. For us, that was an important first step toward uh, prioritizing early childhood education. But it's only, um, I think it's short-sighted to not remember that we cut about $1.2 billion in early childhood education funding as a state in the decade prior to that. So these efforts are really an attempt to reposition early childhood education on the uh, agenda for the state of California also an attempt to remind all of us to be vigilant and to remember that all of our uh, accomplishments over the past few years in early childhood education can be short-lived if we're not vigilant. So I thank you for being here. I thank uh, my colleagues for being here. And I'm looking forward to learning from this dialogue. Thank you, uh, Speaker. And I will note that of all the issues we could have Blue Ribbon Commissions on, this is my understanding the only one. So it's not the most important issue in California. Some would argue that it is, but um, our youth certainly are our future, and uh, this is an opportunity to focus on uh, where we're at, where we've been, and where we're going. Uh, so before we start with the, uh, the program, we wanted to allow our host here at Cerritos College to, to say a few words. Uh, so we'll start with Dr. Fierro. Good morning. Thank you for being here. My name is Jose Fierro, and I'm the president of Cerritos College. And I would like to thank Speaker Rendon and the commission for hosting this important event today in our campus. I believe today's presenters, including the college's very own Sandra Marks, Dean of Health Occupations, will shed significant light about our child development program or the students, experiences, and the future of early childhood education in workforce development. Time and time again, studies have shown that early childhood education strengthens a child's mental, social, and cognitive skills and prepares them for the school and their adult life. However, as many of you are well aware, 
One of the most critical challenges to early childhood education is the significant cost of running these programs, which often creates financial barriers for parents. According to the Center for American Progress, the United States lags behind most developed nations when it comes to investing in early childhood education. This often affects child, child's long-term cognitive and social-emotional development. At Cerritos College, this problem adversely affects many of our low-income students, especially students of color. Many of our students work full-time while attending class in the evenings. They continuously try to find a balance between making ends meet, going to a school, and finding someone to help care for their child. This care often comes with little to no access to early childhood education. As we struggle to find the means to provide early childhood education to all, our nation continues to lose its competitiveness in the global economy. A report by the World Bank shows that for every additional dollar a nation is invest in high quality preschool programs, there is a return on investment of anywhere between $6 and $17. This can often lead to a break in the cycle of poverty and inequality, improving individual outcomes later in life. Thanks to the members of this commission, the speaker, Governor Brown, the state of California has taken a strong instance by increasing funding for early childhood education. Not only does your support for early childhood education impact toddlers and child development, it also dramatically improves the life of our community college students and their families. Early childhood education also enables our students to be well prepared for the classroom and well positioned to transfer for four-year universities or pursue a profession in career and technical education or allied health. Thank you for not only investing in our children, but for also investing in our community colleges. For your support ensures the two to five year old at our child development center have the ability to succeed wherever they go from day one. Thank you and I look forward to a successful hearing. Thank you, Dr. Fierro. Zurich Lewis, President of the Board of Trustees. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Zurich Lewis, and I am President of the Board of Trustees here at Cerritos College. And I want to welcome all of you to our wonderful campus. It's great to see all of you here in support of this very important topic that affects many young children. <coughs> at Cerritos College, we serve over 22,000 students each year, and many of our students come to Cerritos College to pursue our unique and exciting career programs, including child development. The child development program is one of our most successful programs at Cerritos College that helps empower our students with the necessary skills to care and teach the whole child. I want to recognize some of my colleagues here today. Uh, Trustee Marisa Perez and Dr. Sandra Salazar. Uh, both of which are parents and educators in their own right. And as we all know, parents are a key component to the success of early childhood education because learning does not stop in the classroom. It continues at home. I also want to give a special thanks to Assembly Speaker Anthony Rendon and the Commission for allowing Cerritos College the opportunity to host today's hearing. We are honored to share our campus with all of you and our campus community to participate in this important discussion. I hope today's testimonials shed some much needed information on how a community college education and training helps prepare future educators to support a child's development. The college is committed to help this commission in any way possible and I thank you for your time and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you trustee. Next Dean Sandra Marks of the Dean of the Department of Health Occupations. Good morning, everyone. First, let me thank you for the honor and the opportunity to speak with you today. My journey with the Cerritos uh, Child Development Program and the Child Development Center, which is also considered a laboratory or lab school for the program, began five years ago. I must thank the staff and faculty for being as patient with me as possible as I keep learning and understanding their area of expertise. 
Cerritos is one of the 105 out of the 112 California community colleges which offer a child development early child education program. Our educational program and the center have embraced the constructivist um, approach for caring and teaching children and have been greatly influenced by the Reggio Emilia philosophy. After World War II, the city of Reggio Emilia, Italy, had a paradigm shift. The community collectively made a commitment to their children. Everyone would take responsibility to care for and educate the children. They valued their children. The approach helps teachers interact with children, each other, and families. It helps learning how to deal with relationships, creative thinking and expression, just to mention a few. We believe this approach provides the high quality early childhood education so many seek today. And we are so pleased to have hired a program specialist actually raised in Reggio Emilia, Italy. Her expertise has been invaluable to our understanding and implementation of this philosophy. This makes us even more high quality for our children their, family, their families, and our community. The lab school is a very important component. It helps prepare our early childhood educators. It provides a lab where the college students can study and research child development and education, and it offers a service to children and families. It is considered essential for developing high qualified teachers. The source I am citing is uh, written in uh, 2014, and it stated that in the last three years, so I'm assuming 2011 on, 12 lab schools closed, and most have reduced their services. This source only addressed those centers in the Ca California Community College system, so what about all the other centers affiliated with different schools or private? Researchers are citing how the high quality early education improves the young child's progress and helps to close the achievement gap for underprepared pre-kindergartners. And research from Chicago found children who participated in highly qualified preschool and parent coaching programs were 20% less likely to be arrested for a felony or be incarcerated as young adults who did not attend. Educating our children does not start at kindergarten or first grade. It starts the moment of their birth. The most critical period for rapid learning and brain development is from birth to age five. Now there are about eight barriers faced by campuses with lab schools. Lack of funding is the first. <laughs> Competing missions. You know, the service to the child and the family and the education of the student. Just like community colleges have three missions, basic skills, transfers, and workforce development. How do you equally take care of all those missions at the same time? The, the thought that it's a glorified uh, babysitter. This is a deep-seated sentiment, and it's very unworthy of the profession. There is criticism of lab schools. Some are considered ivory towers, not of the real world, and they have a higher socioeconomic population. Low education levels. California is one out of four states without an early learning credential. We have a permit structure, and it seems the more education our teachers get in this environment, they transition to the K-12 because there's higher wages there. Long work hours. You don't, you're not just balancing the care of the child and the families, you're also balancing the academic component as well. Low public perception and low wages. Now this is probably the greatest challenge. A medium annual salary uh, was cited as around $27,000 at Cerritos our salary is between thirty-five and forty-five thousand dollars, and then when they go and get educational, uh, further their education, there's no compensation for that. They stay at that level. 
There's no parity with K-12. 55% of the kindergartner's salary pay, they make 55% less than a kindergarten pay. And they uh, don't have, uh, in the academic setting, the school setting, that's a 12-month work year versus a 12-month work year. And there's high staff turnover. So I don't know how many of you were able to visit our lab school, either today or at some other time, and have seen it. It is an amazing playground, and it's permanent, and it was designed with the constructivist Reggio Emilia concepts in mind. And one of those components is that environment is the third teacher. I think the architecture uh, and the designers enjoyed reclaiming their inner child when they were working on this project. Now the modular units are meant to be temporary, and we had to do many compromises to our philosophy in this construction. The permanent structure was designed to be more open, have a lot more natural light, and have an elevated observational area for students and visitors to observe without interfering with the learning process happening with the children. We also serve the community by having students from the CSU systems come and observe what we do. We have faculty from China come and observe what we do. We are working with uh, doing workshops for the, the surrounding centers to learn what we do. Our CDC, or the lab school, exists because our president and the board of trustees made a commitment to the lab school, its underlining philosophy, and the community. Now, they had to have a little nudge. <laughs> the old child development center was located where they needed to construct a new building, so we were relocated to its current position. Now, it would have been very easy to say at that time that we're closing you, you're too expensive, but they didn't. We have been waiting at least 20 years for a new permanent building. The building is the, this building, the modular unit, exactly what we were hoping for. I have to be honest, no, we are human, um, but we are most appreciative for what we were given and for the support of the Board of Trustees. Because of this move, we were now able to design that amazing permanent playground, and then hopefully someday, hopefully not 20 years, that permanent building will be able to be built with the same, the same spectacular type of uh, philosophy ingrained in the building. We also exist because of the financial support the President and the Board of Trustees provide the center. Our director has done an excellent job of securing grants. We currently have four, which total a little over a million dollars, and she was just awarded another grant for another uh, 715000 But the district sets aside a safety net of funding for us. Yes, we've had to use it. Um, Sometimes around $50,000, sometimes we've gone up to about $185,000, but they're there to support us. Now our goal is to become financially independent someday, but it's really nice to know that they have our backs. As for the child development program, we have been able to increase our class offerings over the past two to three years, and in August, we'll be, we will be offering our first class at the Downey Adult uh, School campus. Our faculty are phenomenal. Every time I go and observe them, I'm, I'm just blown away. They teach in the constructivist format, thereby modeling the type of teaching they will do with the future students. This is not an easy task. We offer certificates, associate degrees, and an AST degree as well, as helping our students with child development permits. Now, record keeping is a challenge, as we all know, so the numbers I'm citing are probably very low. From our research and development data, the top two producers are the early childhood um, associate degree, averaging about 40 a year, and the early childhood certificate, average about 52 a year from 2009 to 2016. Now, if you were to read the 2017 commencement booklet, you would have found 100 associate degrees, 48 of which were ASTs, 63 certificate of achievements were conferred. 
Faculty have helped students obtain about 500 permits this year alone. And at our May 2017 pinning ceremony, we had 100 participants. Susan Gradine, could you just stand? And Deborah Ward, please, could you just stand briefly? Susan's the director of our child development program, and Deborah Ward is the director of our child development center. They are here today to be here to answer any questions that you may have of them. <laughs> Having relocated from Wisconsin, it was not uncommon for people to say, oh, that's California. They're 10 years ahead of everybody else. So, Mr. Rendon, thank you for your awareness of this need for our children, our families, our community, and for being 10 years ahead of everybody else. We are standing in the wings, waiting to assist you with this paradigm shift that needs to occur. We want to be part of valuing our children more, of providing high quality care and educational experiences for our children. To assist them to become the best of themselves that they could be, to become competent and caring citizens of the earth. Thank you for allowing me to be the voice for so many. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Dr. Marks, and thank you for our host from Cerritos College. And, and if we could ask a couple of you to, to maybe go uh, down, because we're going to bring up our, our next presenters, not, not to necessarily kick you off the stage <laughs> there. But that was a nice uh, segue. And by the way, Dr. Marks, that was an amazing facility that we toured this morning. Uh, I know my preschool experience was not like that. I feel like it was a, a cross between a resort and a, and, a, and a showroom for a crate and barrel or something like that. <laughs> but um, nonetheless, it just shows uh, you know, the tremendous work that, that, that's being done here at, at, a, at a lab, but also shows that what we frankly don't have throughout California in so many communities, uh, family members and, and parents and guardians would, would die for an experience like that. And so I think this is a nice uh, segue here for our next presenter, uh, Kristen Schumacher with the California Budget and Policy Center to give us an update on what's happening from the state level and our state budget on uh, ECE. Kristen? Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Co-Chair McCarty and Commissioners. Thank you for all your work that you do on this important topic. And thank you for the invitation to speak here today. Is the presentation live? Yes. Excellent. Is your, is your uh, mic on the green button over there? It is. Okay. Closer? Yes, that'd be great. Great. Thank you. My name is Kristen Schumacher, and I'm a policy analyst at the California Budget and Policy Center. For those of you that aren't familiar, the Budget Center is a nonprofit in Sacramento that engages in fiscal and policy research with the goal of improving the lives of low and middle income Californians. In my remarks today, I'm going to provide a brief overview of funding for California's child care and development system. I'm going to highlight some cuts that have been made to the system, as well as some recent reinvestments. And in doing so, I'm going to provide some data as to where we stand in 17-18 state fiscal year as compared to 07-08, which is our baseline year before the Great Recession hit. Before diving into all of my budget charts, I can't overstate, as everyone in this room knows, how important subsidized care is for families in California that are really struggling to make ends meet. California has the highest poverty rate in the nation when you consider our high cost of living. And we are in the midst of an affordable housing crisis. Research shows that subsidized childcare can help families. It reduces the chance that parents have to miss work or cut their hours due to instability in childcare. It boosts parents' employment and earnings. And it helps families pay for the basics by freeing up dollars for other expenses such as rent or housing costs or utilities or food, just to name a few. Research also, sh also shows that subsidized care can help families by allowing children to benefit from stable and positive relationships with their caregivers and their teachers while their parents are at work, which is so incredibly important. For this reason, early care and education is often referred to as a two-generation approach to producing poverty. Subsidized care is critical because the cost of child care in California is prohibitively expensive, not just in California, across the entire United States. 
Using the most recent data that we have, which is from the 2016 Regional Market Rate Survey, which was just released a couple months ago, we know that the cost of care for an infant in California is about $15,000 per year. That's for a licensed center. Then in a licensed family child care home, the cost is about $9,400 per year. So this chart shows you the share of income different types of families would spend on child care for two kids in a licensed center, an infant and a school-aged child. And that bar on your left is a single parent earning the minimum wage, so about $10.50 an hour. And they're going to make about $22,000 a year. And if they were to try to put their kids in a licensed center without subsidized care, they would spend 95% of their income on the cost of child care, which obviously is not tenable. That middle bar is the annual income just above the initial income eligibility limit for a family of three, which was just increased this year, which is great news. And so that's $52,000. So because this family is not initially involved in the subsidized system, the subsidized care system, child care system, they're not eligible, and they're going to spend 40% of their income on the cost of care. And then finally, the bar on your right is the annual income just above the phase-out ceiling for families that have been utilizing subsidized child care. And once they advance at their place of employment and income out of the system, they're still going to be spending about one-third of their their pre-tax income on the cost of care for their two kids in a licensed center. The reality is, is that the high cost of child care means that a lot of early care and education programs are out of reach for a lot of families throughout California. Unfortunately, programs that help families afford the basics, such as subsidized child care, were cut dramatically during and after the Great Recession, which means they have to offer smaller benefits and or help fewer families. Many of these programs are still funded below pre-recession levels. So the next two charts are going to give you a broad overview of some of the cuts and the reinvestments that were made to California's subsidized child care and development system. This is no, by no means comprehensive. So facing huge budget shortfalls during and after the Great Recession, policymakers slashed about $1 billion from the budget for child care and preschool programs. They cut about 110,000 slots. Provider payment rates and income eligibility limits were frozen. And then for license exempt providers, they even cut their payment rates. The good news is, is that thanks to the advocacy of many in this room and many of our um, leaders here on this stage, there have been a lot of great reinvestments. We've added about 35,000 slots, the majority of which have been for the state preschool program. We've also pro boosted provider payment rates and funded quality improvement programs. And then finally, just this year, we've updated the income eligibility limits and improved family reporting requirements, which is great news for families. So that begs the question, where does that leave us now? So this chart shows you Annual, fu annual funding for child care and development system in California. And the bar on your left is the 0708 enacted figure. This includes funding for the state preschool program and subsidized child care programs, CalWORKs and now on CalWORKs programs, and then also uh, some funding for um, support and quality improvement programs as well. And even though we've made some great strides in recent years, we're still, after adjusting for inflation, more than 500 million below our pre-recession funding levels. So we still have a lot of work to do. In addition, despite the reinvestments and all the slots that we've added in recent years, we still have far fewer slots than we did before the recession. And so the total number of funded slots in 0708 was 459,000. And at the peak of the cuts, or at the trough, I should say, we were down about 110,000 slots. That was in the 2012-13 state fiscal year. And as you can see, over time, we've improved. We've gradually added more and more funded slots. But yet still, we're down about 67,000 slots from 0708. So the prior chart looked at funded slots, which is just an estimate of how many children may be served based on the average cost of care throughout the year. And these estimates of full year enrollment are calculated by the California Department of Finance, and it's just an estimate. So it's also really useful to look at the actual number of children served. And so this chart shows you the average monthly enrollment figures. The blue section of the bars is the California State Preschool Program, the yellow section is the CalWORKs Child Care, and then the orange section is the non-CalWORKs Child Care. 
And from 0910 to 1516, you'll see that there is 11% drop in the state preschool program, 22% drop in CalWORKs child care, and then a 13% drop in non-CalWORKs child care, which includes um, general child care program and alternative payment program, and then a couple of other smaller programs as well. If you take this trend back to 0708, which I don't actually have on this chart, we are down 100,000 children from 0708 to 1560, and there's our actual number of children served down 100,000, or one quarter. The final child care char chart shows the income eligibility limit for a family of three as a share of the state median income for a family of the same size. And so in 0708, prior to the Great Recession, the income limit was set at 75% of the current state median income. From that point forward, the income limit was frozen, but the state median income continued to increase. And as you can see, the, value, or the, the income limits, while a frozen, dropped as a share of the state median income, which meant that families were earning more in California, but we weren't actually taking that into consideration, so they're losing access to care faster. It's important that, also I should note, that in 2016, we were down to about 60% of the state median income, but thanks to the advocacy of many in this room, the income limits have been increased, and in 1718, it's back up to 70% of the most current state median income, which is truly great news. So at this point, I'm going to transition to a discussion of CalWORKs. And for those of you that may not know, that's California's Welfare to Work program. Um, it's one of the state's major anti-poverty programs, and well over three quarters of a million children throughout California benefit from this program. I'm talking about CalWORKs because subsidized childcare is offered as a key component of the program, and it's a critical piece of um, the overall childcare and development system in California. Two out of five kids served in California subsidized childcare programs are receiving care via CalWORKs. So to understand how families are faring in California and to understand how they're utilizing subsidized care, one has to know a little bit about CalWORKs too. So similar to other programs, cuts were made during the Great Recession, including cutting grant levels, eliminating the cost of living adjustment for the CalWORKs grant, limiting welfare to work activities, and then making some really dramatic changes to CalWORKs child care that resulted in a loss of um, enrollment. Fortunately, in recent years, we've also seen some positive changes. They've boosted, positive policymakers have boosted grants. They've created some new funding for housing programs. They've eliminated a punitive and racist family cap rule. And as part of this year's um, budget agreement, they've implemented some education incentives as well. So again, we ask, where does that leave us now? So despite some modest increases to the CalWORKs grant, the maximum family grant fails to lift families out of deep poverty. So this chart shows you the annualized maximum grant for a family of three as a percentage of the federal poverty line. And for 10 straight years, the maximum family grant has failed to lift families out of deep poverty. And many families don't earn the maximum family grant or don't receive the maximum family grant. And for those of you that may not be familiar, deep poverty is commonly defined as 50% of the federal poverty line. For a family of three, that means making ends meet on about $10,000 per year. In California in 2015, about 800,000 kids were living in deep poverty. This has huge consequences, as we're going to hear in a bit. Poverty has an enormous impact on children. And so it's important to support CalWORKs families and these children to the best of our abilities. Finally, even though, as I mentioned earlier, there have been many changes to CalWORKs child care, a lot of them have been um, reversed or phased out, many families aren't actually utilizing this benefit. So when comparing the average number of families receiving CalWORKs from 0708 to 1516, which is the most recent year we have data, we're actually serving about 30,000 more families overall in the CalWORKs program, yet during that period, enrollment in CalWORKs child care has actually gone down by about one third. So we've seen some gains in recent years. You'll see the 1415 and 1516 bars, but yet we're still not serving as many children as we used to. And there are a variety of reasons why we might not be serving these families. They may not be utilizing care due to a young child exemption, or perhaps they're unaware of the program. But regardless, it's really important to, under, to make sure that the CalWORKs families know about CalWORKs child care and are utilizing the benefit if it works for their families. 
So budgets just aren't, outco aren't just outcomes. They're actually statements about our values and priorities moving forward. It's critical that we work to protect the gains that we've made for California's children and families and to continue this mo momentum and to actually build on this momentum. Investing in safety net programs like CalWORKs and subsidized child care strengthens our economy, it improves our quality of life, and then finally and most importantly, it demonstrates that everyone has value regardless of their income. On this final slide, you'll see the Budget Center's contact information. Feel free to follow our work. You have our Twitter handles as well, and you can contact me at any time if you have questions or would like to talk about subsidized childcare. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Kristen. Uh, before we uh, go on to our, our next uh, uh, panel with Dr. Thompson about early brain development, I wanted to open it up to, for a few moments here, to. Uh, commissioners, if they have any questions or comments from the uh, California Budget Project. I'll, I'll, as you're thinking about, I'll just note that it just shows that, I know as a speaker noted in, in his first year, uh, we took great st strides to try to um, uh, return some of those dollars to preschool and child care, $500 million. And this year we had to fight just to keep that in the budget, and we were able to do a little bit more with the um, adjusting the SMI and the 12 month eligibility, but it shows that we have a lot more work to do. So thank you for, for highlighting that. Questions or comments? Michael? <coughs> Kristen, you, you com hope you can hear me because the sound up here is a little <coughs> bit funny um, for us, not for you guys. Uh, so I, I wonder if you have any data that shows, you know, you compared the current versus 7-8 but there's been a reduction in the number of children being born bec because of the recession that hasn't really rebounded. And in the last year, there seems to be more of an out-migration than an in-migration um, from other, you know, from immigration because of the, the federal stuff that's going on. Do you have any kind of data that kind of compares those pieces? I'm trying to figure out what the, is the need of what it, do you have to replace everything from seven eight, or would it be a slightly different? Or you know, do you have any information on that? Sure, that's a great great question. Um, I don't at my fingertips have those numbers, but they're probably something we could probably pull for you if you're interested yeah. and follow up with you on that. Now, are you talking about just the overall total child population? Or are you talking about um, children living um, under the income limits? Well, the total population seems to be down somewhat right. yeah, it is. Uh, income limit limits uh, now, now with the SMI being adjusted would go up um, so those are two number you know and the other thing is is that when you look at the CalWORKs participation the the those numbers seem to be down and even with the exemptions uh, being lifted uh, the numbers haven't really rebounded and what we're being told is that it, that's because the number of um, participants in CalWORKs has gone down significantly just because the economy is so much better, and I, I don't know whether that's really true or not. I'm, well, I, the data really show the that the number of families being served is actually up in that time period. Okay. Kristen, um, California's minimum wage increase is important and something that we should be proud of. But I wondered if you could talk also about any kind of unintended consequences that there are for early childhood education, how it's affecting the workforce and families, and what yeah. we might begin to be thinking about to address that. And if I could just ask uh, folks real quick, we are being live streamed here, so mm -hmm. all of California can engage and, and watch, but we, we need to talk into the mic, we're told, so people can hear us across the great state of California. Sure, I think that's a great question, and the good news is is that this year we've updated the income limits, and prior to that, a family with two parents working full-time at the minimum wage were becoming ineligible for subsidized care, but now that we've actually boosted the income limits, we actually see that parents are, can actually earn up to close to a sustainability threshold for making ends meet before they lose access to subsidized care which is hugely important because it serves the purpose of allowing families to get their, their bearings, to um, gain some traction and really work their way towards economic security before they lose this great saf safety net program. Um, Kristen, 
um, thank you first for providing this this overview. Um, I know that you you derived to, uh, at this data from licensed centers, and I also noticed that you pulled a lot of it from stage two. So, how much of a fluctuation would there be if you were to include like family child care homes because there are so many in the state? Would it be would it change the numbers tremendously? So are you talking about the, um, the figures for the actual number served? Right. So that actually includes um, CalWORKs Child Care and non-CalWORKs Child Care. That's all inclusive. It includes all programs. Couple more questions before the next panel. Kristen, thank you for this. It's really, really good information. Um, and I know you've done a lot of other reports, so mine's going to be a little bit of a tangent to this. But um, specifically, when we're looking at age groups and percentage of age groups served of eligible, el eligible children. Mm -hmm. And can you um, talk to us a little bit, um, because obviously there have been a tremendous amount of reinvestments in preschool and three and four year olds in particular. Can you talk a little bit about what age group in particular is being severely underserved currently and is that growing or how are we in comparison to seven, eight? So I can compare it to 07, 08, but I did, um, some analysis that we actually never released looking at um, the number of children served by age group and it shows that infants and toddlers are not um, served as a share of number eligible at the same rate as um, preschool children specifically and one has to be careful there though because it looks at CalWORKs child care and there are a number of families that aren't engaging in CalWORKs child care because they have some sort of young child exemption and so uh, these data don't take, the, when I was looking at the data, they didn't take into account that um, some of those families aren't engaging in subsidized care because they're choosing to stay home with their children. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And we'll try to stay on schedule here. And again, thank you so much, Kristen. Uh, next we have Dr. Thompson, who's going to talk to us about early brain development. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ross Thompson. I am a professor of psychology at the University of California at Davis, and I am honored to be, to be with you this morning. So thank you very much. Um, I, I don't think... And did you have a, a PowerPoint? I do. You did, I just, are, okay. I'm going to make sure we have it up there for you. There we go. There we go. Okay. Thank you. I, I don't think I exaggerate if I say that, that we're at an absolutely historic moment in terms of our understanding of the components that go into healthy child development, including the influences on the developing brain. Um, but we're also at an historic moment in terms of understanding the kinds of experiences and environments that contribute to that optimal development. So in a way that, that I would not have been able to comment on, say, 10 years ago, um, we actually have in our hands a lot of the tools for, for thinking about how do we have the best impacts uh, in ensuring that, that children reach school ready to learn. And that's part of our goal here. And of course, a lot of the reason for that is the revolution that's been taking place in our understanding of, of early childhood development from the point of view of understanding the developing brain. It was 20 years ago that the I Am Your Child campaign in 1997 brought to the attention of um, the American population all the work of developmental neuroscience um, that was pointing to the importance of the early years um, for shaping not only the developing brain, but also um, early learning capacity and potential. Uh, and since that time, I think some, some, some basic elements of the brain development story have, have become more widely known. And, and some of those elements have to do with, with simply the, the process by which brain development occurs. We know that the period of, of birth through five is a period of absolutely exuberant growth in the brain. Uh, it is not the most rapid period of brain development, interestingly enough. The prenatal period is when brain development occurs most dramatically. But, but after birth, um, the story of brain development is one of, of successive waves of um, exuberant connections between, that occur between uh, neurons that have developed within the, within the brain, uh, a period that is sometimes referred to colloquially as blooming or more technically synaptogenesis, um, in which literally neurons are, are forming connections uh, in, in a rapid and exuberant fashion to create a brain of extraordinarily, extraordinary potential. 
Um, the problem is that a brain with that kind of potential does not work very efficiently. And so the second wave of brain development uh, is, involves the experience-based retraction of some of those connections uh, to result in a number of connections retained uh, that are functional for the child's early experience, or sometimes colloquially called pruning. Uh, and the result of that is an experience-based sculpting of the brain uh, that helps to create a brain that is optimally suited to the environment uh, that the child has experienced in the early years. Um, it's consistent with, with what we sometimes call the, the use it or lose it uh, idea. And the idea here is that, is that experiences and the brain is not discriminating as to whether those experiences are positive or negative, um, help to shape the architecture of the brain. Uh, language development is a really good example of that, where we know that in the first six months of life, six, eight, six to eight months of life, uh, as a result of that blooming of neural connections in language learning areas of the brain, um, the child at this age is, is literally a citizen, uh, figuratively rather, a citizen of the world. Uh, the child is capable, in other words, of making out speech phonemes for a whole range of human languages. Because, of course, the brain at birth cannot know whether their birth has landed them in London or Kiev or Tokyo or, or, um, or any other city around the country that will require their learning one or more different language systems. So the brain has this enormous potential to learn all sorts of languages during the first six months of life. But that's not a very efficient language learning brain. And so that subsequent period of pruning, which we see by the end of the first year, results in a loss of that universal language learning capacity as the brain becomes specialized to become an English language learner, uh, or a Spanish language learner, or both. Um, and as a result of that losing of that capacity for, le for learning all languages, the brain becomes optimally suited to become a language learner of the language that the, that the brain has been overhearing. And this results in the vocabulary explosion of the second year that I'll be talking about a little bit later. This idea then is something that is um, characterizing brain development um, in various areas of the brain that relate to different psychological processes. And so if we think in the timeline that I've outlined here, beginning prenatally and continuing through birth in the early months of the first year, and then finally the years leading into young adulthood, uh, we can find that that blooming and pruning process occurring, uh, recapitulating itself uh, at different timetables for different areas of the brain. Earliest for sensory areas, because those are most basic, and then language development, as I mentioned earlier, continuing on to age 12, can't understand why we were learning a second language at the end of this period rather than at the beginning, but that's because um, most of our instructors didn't know about brain development. Uh, and then higher cognitive functions have a much more extended developmental timetable. Uh, but note this, self-regulation takes the longest period of time to consolidate. Um, and that may be consistent with those of us who are uh, raising adolescents at this point. Um, one thing to note, though, is, is how much of this action, how much of this blooming and some of the pruning uh, is characterized in the first two years of life. Um, a period that is absolutely formative in terms of establishing these, these brain capacities uh, and how much more we find occurring during the first five years. And consistent with the idea that early skill begets skill, we now have behavioral evidence showing us that the early influences that are occurring that we're describing here uh, are ones that really do make a difference in terms of children's later achievement. So for example, there is evidence indicating that a child's vocabulary at age three um, does predict third grade reading scores. And the reason third grade reading scores are important is because they are reliable predictors of the likelihood that a child will graduate in high school. Now, now the story that I've told you is, is, is essentially brain development 101. It's, it's the research that the developmental neuroscience had told us and, and is continued to elaborate on. It's, it's a message, I think, that has begun to get through to the public. But as that message has been getting through, Developmental neuroscientists have moved on to brain development 2.0 or 3.0, and there's more to say now about what we know about influences on the developing brain, and that's really what I'd like to uh, spend the rest of my time talking about. And I want to summarize these, these new advances in knowledge um, with three phrases. Um, stress, social experience, um, and starting early because I think this is where the new science has helped to elaborate, flesh out, and I think giving us, gives, us, gives us some clues about what we have to be concerned with respect to early learning. Uh, so let's begin with stress. 
There is now considerable research indicating that far and away from children at the early years being buffered from the effects of chronic stress, um, their brains are plastic enough that they are being affected by uh, chronic stressful experiences that may be part of their lives. Indeed, what research is showing is that the neurocircuitry of our biological stress responsive systems that include several regions of the brain actually become altered as a result of chronic stressful experiences. They can be altered in a couple of different ways, but one of the more familiar ways in which they become altered is that they result in a stress responsive system that becomes hypervigilant to threat and danger. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is as if the brain's antenna are out um, to detect um, future instances of threat um, or danger to the child um, because of its frequency within the past in order for the child's uh, coping systems to become mobilized and to be able to respond accordingly. Um, and the behavioral effects of this are ones that um, any preschool educator in the state of California um, will acknowledge, uh, and that is that these are the children who behaviorally um, uh, are overreacting to peer provocation that no other child would necessarily be bothered by. Um, they are falling apart emotionally when they are gently reprimanded by a teacher. Um, but these are also the child, children who are having trouble focusing their attention in the classroom, uh, who are having trouble mobilizing their problem-solving skills when faced with a cognitive challenge. Um, they're having difficulty controlling their impulses uh, and getting along with others. And when I describe this to early education groups that I speak with in California, uh, there is, as there is in this audience, uh, nods of acknowledgement that these are the children that preschool educators are seeing in greater and greater amounts. Now, it's incumbent on me as, a, as an academic to define my terms. And when I use the term stress, that can easily be, be uh, misunderstood. What I am not referring to um, are the experiences of positive stress. Uh, yes, there is something called positive stress. Um, these are the experiences we want children to undergo that help to strengthen their coping capacities, that help them to manage delays that can be frustrating but nevertheless are part of everyday experience. That is not what I'm talking about. Uh, nor am I talking about what we might call tolerable stress, which consists of you know, serious, potentially overwhelming experiences, but nevertheless are buffered by social support. Children know that somebody has their back, and that can make a lot of potentially overwhelming, stressful experiences tolerable for a child. That's how social support works for all of us. But it's especially necessary for a young child who depends on the nurturance of others um, in order for them to get through those kinds of experiences. What I am talking about is what we call in the, in the popular media at least toxic stress. And these are serious, sometimes prolonged, stressful experiences. Uh, but what is most distinctive is that social support is absent. So the child is literally facing them by themselves. Examples of toxic stress are things like a child who has been physically or emotionally abused, who experiences regular neglect, and neglect accounts for the large majority of reports of child maltreatment. But it can also include things like a mother who is experiencing prolonged postnatal depression. It can, experience, it can include family violence uh, in which a child now, uh, now has to uh, cope with parents being emotionally unavailable and indeed distress themselves. Uh, it can include uh, poverty. Uh, and as Kristen had mentioned earlier, according to the supplemental uh, poverty Index released by the U.S. Census Department, California has the highest rate of child poverty. And what this underscores for us, I think, is the reminder that toxic stress is something a little bit different for young children than it is for uh, us as adults. Uh, yes, issues of violence and trauma do constitute toxic stress for young children. But because young children depend so significantly on the nurture and care of those on whom they depend, Toxic stress for young children also includes parents who are depressed, who are chronically anxious, who are emotionally unavailable, who cannot be for the child the kind of parent that they need to deal with the stresses that the child is encountering. And the, uh, the incidence of poverty in California and the numbers of children living in poverty in California, I think warrants serious concern about the numbers of children who are experiencing toxic stress uh, in our state. Completing the story of stress, at least the story that I can tell in the time we have today, um, is the recognition that it's not just 
the biological stress responsive systems in the brain that are sensitive to stress hormones that toxic stress is associated with. But in fact, several other areas of the brain are sensitive to those stress hormones, including the hippocampus, which is the part of the brain that helps to um, store current experiences in memory. If there's anything I'm saying today, commissioners, that you remember tomorrow, it's because your hippocampus has been active. Um, well, the hippocampus is affected by the experience of stress. Uh, so also um, are the frontal lobes, which among other things help to manage self-regulation in children as well as the rest of us. It's one of the reasons why children who experience chronic stress often experience self-regulatory challenges. Uh, and it includes the temporal lobes, which is the seat of, of language development. Um, what we know now is that these areas of the brain are also affected by chronic stress. These effects have been documented in studies with children as young as three or four years of age and have shown that structural changes in these areas of the brain help to account for concurrent lag shown by the same children on standardized measures of language, math, and executive functioning. To put it somewhat differently, children under stress have trouble with early learning and it's not because they don't want to. It's because of the ways in which their brains are being reshaped by the stress that they're bringing from elsewhere in their lives into an early childhood classroom. And as a result, uh, they're having troubles concentrating, thinking, and self-regulating. There are other consequences of chronic stress, including its effects on immune system functioning. But the bottom line is what this has led to um, is the growing uh, recognition of the need uh, for trauma-informed teaching and trauma-informed care. In many school districts in the country, trauma-informed teaching is something that educators are learning about and about how best to help children that they're experience, that they're in their classrooms who are experiencing chronic stress. But trauma-informed educa early education and care is something new for us. And one of the challenges is how do we support those preschool and infant toddler educators who are why witnessing children in their classrooms who are stressed and are not having the tools for knowing how to address that. The epidemic of preschool expulsions is one reflection of the inability to know how do you deal with a child who is reshaping your classroom because of their own threat vigilance. Um, I want to turn now to talking about the second area of new research uh, of new discovery concerning early brain development, and this has to do with the importance of relationships. I mentioned earlier about the vocabulary explosion that takes place in the second year that processes of brain blooming and pruning have helped to prepare for. And what, uh, what we have also learned about that vocabulary explosion is how much the nature of that increase in vocabulary in the second year is affected by a child's experiences at home by their relationships. So let me show from the Hart and Risley data how this varies for children growing up in different families in different economic circumstances. And what the research shows is that by the time a child is, is three years of age, um, children growing up for the more economically advantaged homes have working vocabularies that are more than twice the size of those of other groups. Um, and that it is in part because children in those families have been hearing more vocabulary. That is the story of vocabulary development that has begun to make its way into public attention, as well as should. It has resulted in a number of public initiatives to try to reduce what is called the 30 million word gap, and there is good value to that. But what is often overlooked in this research is that the same study found that it was not just how many words children heard, but how words were used in the family that predicted vocabulary development. In particular, children growing up in economically advantaged families tended to have words used with them in the context of talking about their experiences, in the context of storybook reading, in the context of storytelling, as opposed to words being used primarily for the purposes of controlling and directing the child's behavior. And this suggests, consistent with new research in this area, that it is the social context, the relational context in which words are used, that is the more important predictor of vocabulary development. In, study pub in a study published just recently, researchers found that measures of the interaction that was going on between parents and children at 24 months were as good predictors of the child's vocabulary a year later as the sheer numbers of words that children were hearing. And by quality of interaction, researchers were referring to 
that mutual back and forth responsiveness of parent and child, what we sometimes call serve and return, and the mother's use of gestures and her attentiveness to the child's focus of interest in talking about what the child had, had been drawn to. And I use this as an example of how developmental neuroscientists have now developed a new appreciation of the significance of social experience for early brain development and the recognition that from very early on, social experiences are privileged experiences for drawing a child's attention to new uh, opportunities for learning, to helping the child learn from those experiences, for instilling the child's curiosity and so forth. What we know is that the early developing brain is very attentive to what is new. It is focused on novelty. But it is also seeking patterns and predictability in the environment. And there is nothing that provides so much of this as an adult who is responsive to the child's interests and is building on those interests. This is true not just in the context of parent-child interaction, um, but it is also true in the context of the interactions children have outside of the home in that same kind of contingent responsiveness that occurs between a child and an early care and education provider. That wonderful, wonderful preschool center that we toured earlier today was absolutely fantastic. My wife runs the center, comparable center at UC Davis, and she'll be glad to hear about it. But I will tell you that when children think about the environment in which they are spending their day there, they're thinking about the environment of relationships that they have with caregivers who are providing that kind of responsiveness. And that is what moves us from thinking about the nature of early care as a means of adult workforce support to the nature of early education and the relationships that provide that education in those same settings. And how do we provide the support that educators need in order to develop those relationships? We know, for example, that when caregivers are stressed, um, it makes a difference. In one study, um, one recent study um, linked depressive symptomatology in home and center-based caregivers to behavioral problems in the three-year-olds in their care. And it was the link between the caregiver's depression and the behavioral problems in kids was owing in part to the lower quality of care children received. And then finally, the last message is beginning early. Now this is controversial because the work on early brain development has often been criticized just, justifiably for neglecting the fact that brains continue to develop throughout the lifespan. I have two adult sons, and, and I think I'm still seeing brain development in them as well. Um, and so we have always been cautious about saying the first five years are important, but not exclusively so. However, new research findings are focusing our attention even earlier for two reasons. One is there are some really scary findings out there, uh, and I don't use that term loosely for how early, early brain structure, as well as function, is being affected by poverty and other chronic stressors within the first two years. So the experience-based sculpting of the brain that we have talked about for a long time, we are now finding poverty is showing structural effects um, that we know have have, have behavioral consequence. That's one reason we're, we're especially concerned now about the early years. And also of research findings that are showing how early children who are in risky circumstances are falling behind not only cognitively but also social emotionally and with respect to self-regulation. Many of those who are the strongest advocates of preschool education are now also attending to what's happening in the birth to three space because of the numbers of three-year-olds they were finding were already behind by the time they started a high quality preschool program. And this is why state-of-the-art assessments of early care and education settings and of their quality are focusing on relational features of that care. Uh, more than the structural features of the center, it's the quality of what is going on between children and those care providers. Um, those are the messages I had wanted to convey to you. And as I close, I want to draw your attention to a recently released report from the National Academy of Sciences. It came out two years ago, entitled Transforming the Workforce for Children Birth Through Age 8, a Unifying Foundation. Uh, I was one of the members of the committee that produced this report. And I commend it to you primarily because the central question we were asked to address was this. How do we prepare an early childhood workforce to prepare young children with high quality, continuous support for their learning and development from birth to age eight? And in uh, the 
science that was prepared for that report, including brain science, uh, we tried to make an argument that what we really need are continuous experiences that help to build on children's early skills to compound them in such a way that they are ready for school and ready for uh, achievement uh, from birth to age eight. I will mention also that the National Academies are currently in the midst of another blue ribbon panel that is looking at the funding of those systems. And from what I hear from the reports that are released on an interim basis, it is very clear they are moving toward a model of public-private partnership in financing the quality of care and education systems that we need. I have taken more time than I was offered, and I apologize for that, but thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Thompson. Uh, that was fabulous, and we're right on time. And I know there's going to be some <laughs> questions and comments from, uh, from us up here, as well as from maybe the audience and public comment in a bit. And so while the others prepare, I, I just want to, to ask you if you could maybe uh, dig into a little bit more. Of course, our, our Blue Ribbon Commission is tasked with looking at the, the landscape today, uh, what's happening, challenges, and potential solutions to help guide policymakers, including current legislators up here who are work on these issues today and tomorrow, but also in the, in the years to come, whether it's for the future legislature or future governors and so forth. And so uh, thinking about that uh, on this, this issue, it's, you know, intuitively people think, yeah, with individuals with uh, stressful home situation and toxicity in their lives, they're going to have challenges in learning. And I think w people get that, but the research shows exactly what it is. So what, what can we do as far as solutions? I know you talked about uh, trauma-informed uh, teaching, uh, best practices. What, what are some of the, you think, that some of the cost-effective interventions that we ought to be looking at here in California, knowing that we don't uh, have, uh, you know, we're not swimming in billions of dollars to invest, but, but if there is a will to, to really dig into this, what are some of the things that we should be doing now to, to tackle this issue? Right. Well, we have tools that we can build on. Um, one is, um, as a result of the initiatives of the Affordable Care Act, states were given a large pot of money to support the development and expansion of evidence-based home visitation programs. And California has benefited from that as well as other states. The reason that evidence-based is so important is that the difference between evidence-based home visitation in terms of its effects on children and families and those that are not can be quite significant. And building on that foundation in California and elsewhere is one way of helping parents right at the beginning um, in a two-generation sense to be able to provide the kinds of experiences for their very young children that, um, that are necessary. Um, secondly, I think that the challenge we face in California as well as elsewhere is what to do with a birth to three space, a place that um, some very smart people at California philanthropies are beginning to tackle, including the Packard Foundation. Um, because that is the area where the quality needs to be the highest because this is where we are already seeing children's uh, brains, minds expanding. Um, even though it's, they don't act like Albert Einstein, it's what's going on inside. And yet we're also knowing that this is a period of significant stress for children. As just one example of that, did you know that um, the younger a child is in this country, including California, the more they are likely to be living in a family in poverty? So that it's our birth to three kids who are actually a higher proportion in below the poverty line mm -hmm. than even three to five-year-olds or, for that matter, children up to age 18. I don't know how, what is the best strategy for reaching out to those who care for the birth to three kids. Those are often in unregulated uh, kinds of family, friend, and neighbor settings. But that is our major challenge. And then finally, I suggest that um, we need to be thinking not just of a care system for children, but a care and education system. And when we talk about increasing the slots for children to promote adult workforce participation, it's very, very important for us to think about the quality of those slots to make sure that children are, are, are learning in those contexts. Okay, thank you. Yes. So just to, uh, just to dig into that a little bit more, um, 
Th because your comments are so helpful, it, it, it made me start thinking in a different direction. I wonder, do we know anything now about the participation of the children whom, who are most likely to have experienced toxic stress in our existing early education system? And in, in part, I'm thinking about this because my observation in LA in particular is that our early childhood education system is pretty difficult to navigate. And families who have had some experience of toxic stress or where their children would may be least well positioned to navigate. Do, do we know anything about that? Or could you speculate with sort of how, where we stand right now in that right. regard? Well, I can speculate, but the term toxic stress is not a diagnostic category. It's, it's more or less of a term of art. And, and in fact, the science <coughs> continues to unfold about the nature of toxic stress and its effects upon the brain. I mentioned, for example, that it can have different kinds of effects. I described one of them. Rather, but another way it can, it can affect the brain is not just, not just creating a hyperactive hyper arousal or hyper activation in response to threat or danger, but actually a shutting down of the system. Uh, and we think the behavioral effects of that are different, but we're not quite sure. So uh, it, it would be hard for me to do anything but speculate. But I have never spoken to an early education group. Uh, I've never spoken to communities of teachers and not have them all tell me that they're seeing more children showing signs of stress in their classrooms than they'd ever seen before. Um, and I think you, your comment earlier was also on target in the sense that given, given that we know that uh, a child who has spent time in poverty is uh, 10 times more likely to be at low income at age 35 compared to one who is not, um, it is quite likely that children are growing up with parents who themselves experienced um, the kind of chronically toxic stressful experiences that have helped to shape how they are parenting and how they're responding. So we're dealing with multi-generational effects here. Is that helpful? Okay. So we have Sonia, then Nina, and then Tanya. Thank you. Thank you so much for that great presentation. And, and I think one of my biggest takeaways is um, the earlier comments when we started this conversation around the role that teachers play and, and I think I'm going to walk away understanding that absent of an ECE credential there's just so much work that needs to happen for as we speak about the workforce. Um, a couple weeks ago someone rightly stated that uh, we should call um, providers EC architect or, or I'm sorry brain architects and I think that's that's so right on and I think with your presentation you solidify that and the, the question I have for you is, um, you talk about uh, the type of stress that can happen within the home and, and the type of stress around in, uh, different environments, particularly you use the example of a center. Can you talk a little bit about community toxic stress? Um, because you did emphasize the importance of the environment. And I wonder if there's any research that uh, talks about community toxic stress, so anything outside of the home and the impact that that could have on, on, on young learners. Yeah. Well, that's a wonderful question. Um, and recognizing that I'm being live streamed and recorded, um, I'm, hesitant, I'm hesitant to go much beyond my, my knowledge, which is I don't know of research that has thought about community stress within the context of child development. Um, but let me offer a somewhat different perspective uh, on this that may address part of what you're asking. Um, we, are not we would not be surprised to think, to know, in fact, the research indicates that, that in neighborhoods where families are under stress, especially for economic reasons, uh, the quality of child care and education programs to which they can send their children are not of high quality. In addition, we have substantial research from the work by Marcy Whitebrook's group at Berkeley that caregivers who are in those settings, caregivers who are in many early education settings, are themselves stressed. When I cited the study about depressive symptomatology, uh, it wasn't by accident that they decided to measure that, is that depressive symptomatology is quite common among those who provide early care and education opportunities. So what you face is a situation where, instead of young children experiencing their care and education setting, as a respite from stress that they experience elsewhere in their lives, which is what a trauma-informed care setting can be like. 
they may be experiencing a continuation of the stress they experience elsewhere. Only now from care providers who are themselves experiencing stress in their own lives and because the quality of the center is one that does not support a different kind of experience. Um, and that is the picture that the research enables us to assemble based on what we know of the availability of high quality care in the settings where it's most needed. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Always a pleasure to hear you. Um, I have a question for you. It's, it's more of a, if I could give you a magic wand question than anything else. And that's um, um, similar to my colleagues. You know, we, we have a finite amount of money at this time period. And um, we are looking at reinvestments into the system. And certainly we did a lot in terms of access for eligibility for families in this previous year, as well as um, an increase to reimbursement rates for providers. Um, there were also increases to um, preschools, preschool spaces, right? So there has been um, a lot of investment in increasing access for three and four-year-olds. Um, we also do talk about zero to three, but I'm wondering if you had a magic wand and we gave you $500 million, where do you think in this moment would be the biggest bang for our buck, so to speak? Where would we make the biggest difference? Is it in the universality of um, preschool care? Is it in reducing the eligibility list? Is it touching more of those zero to three, realizing we're not gonna get all of them? Just from, from your perspective, where do you think with limited resources at this moment in time, we may be able to make the biggest impact in the long run? Oh, wow. Very small question, I know. <laughs> well, of, of course, a question like that presented to an academic who doesn't have to face voters uh, <laughs> is in some respects a luxury, despite being live streamed. Um, well, consistent with what I presented earlier, I would invest uh, that kind of funding in developing an infrastructure to provide um, support and paraprofessional guidance for those who work in the birth to three space, which right now is the wild, wild west in terms of the nature and quality of care. And, and, I, and this is a heavy lift. Um, you know, this is why there are very smart people, smarter than I, who are trying to think of how do you do that? Because um, there are some professional organizations, but most people in that space are not connected that way. But that would be my magic wand. That's where I think a state initiative can create both the attention uh, and begin building an infrastructure and then create private part public private partnerships on a local level. Um, now, since you opened the door to me, uh, I would say that I think that California can do well by trying to change the concept of early care to early care and education. And in that rhetoric, um, we, we have a history in this field of thinking about early care in two streams, and they are now beginning to intersect. The traditional stream has been early care as a means of adult workforce participation. And in that context, we were mainly concerned about children being safe uh, and being relatively happy. But it wasn't until the brain development research began to take hold that we started thinking about now early education. And that means that the setting has to be more than just children being safe. It, we're thinking about how their brains are developing in those contexts. And years ago when we were at the, in the depth of, of the recession and I was asked by a member of one of the legislative budget committees a question very much like yours. Um, I said that sometimes when a system is hit, it's time to rethink about how to re-sculpt the system to better meet contemporary needs. And I think if we can have our California preschool system and our CalWORKs also attending to quality, which they do, um, and make that part of the incentive, it would change our thinking about what children's experiences are. I could go on and on. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Dr. Tom, man, my, yeah, my brain is all over the place right now. So I'm going to try to narrow this down, but I'm always intrigued with uh, discussions about, about brain development. Um, as a family child care provider, 
Over the last 24 years, I have had the unfortunate opportunity of recognizing stress in children, but also in their parents. And at times, and I know some of my family providers who are here in the audience, at times trying to figure out how to not allow um, that stress to <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, affect me with the job that I'm doing. And I see my friend Billy Trong out there who feeds homeless families and he, he sees this also with, with children. So um, I know there are a lot of unreported situations like what I'm saying right now. How do you, how do we address those hidden situations that we don't know about in order for us to fight the challenges, you know what I mean, to, to do whatever it is that we can so that people don't get um, looked over or left behind, or how do we make sure that, that providers and everybody who deals with, with families and ourselves, um, man, protect everybody who, who gets caught up in that. Yes. Yeah. Does that does that make the the sense? question the question is a fantastic question and and what it does is to underscore I think for people who are serving young children um, often sacrificially how little support they receive from the world that benefits from their efforts um, not long ago the mayor of the District of Columbia Marion Bowser decided to institute provisions to increase the education level of those who work in child care programs that are publicly funded. And out of that came a, 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 um, some critical reaction saying all you're going to do is improve, increase the cost of care and make it more unaffordable. To which others responded, why would we want individuals who are devoting themselves in this area, many, most of whom are women, many of whom are women of color, and many of whom are in their own economic difficulty, not to be encouraged and supported to get education and to increase their, their earnings in the context of providing such an essential service. So I think one answer to your question is reframing our thinking about the workforce here. And while we're working on those public-private partnerships that will help to address the, the financing of that system, simply helping people in California to appreciate that they are in the brain development business and they are serving a very essential function. One way we can do that is to look to other states that have thought about this as well. In California, we don't have an executive level Department of Early Childhood Development the way that Washington does to provide a bellwether setting that around which early childhood issues can have continuous attention. We could do that. Um, there are also a number of private-public partnerships that states have initiated in states like Oklahoma and Georgia, where they have put public money together with private sources in order to improve the infrastructure. Um, and so I think that, that other states can sometimes give us clues, even though we remain 10 years ahead of the rest of the country. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McCarty had to catch a flight, so I will be taking over the rest of the meeting. Um, thank you for your comments. And is there any other commissioners that would like to either comment or have more questions for Dr. Thompson? Yes, go ahead. Dr. Thompson, you mentioned the Transforming the Workforce Birth to yes. Age report, which is quite comprehensive. Um, and I appreciate that. But I'm also interested, sort of along the lines of my colleagues, in terms of what might you lift to the surface in um, initial policy and or budget steps that California might do so that we can do a better job in supporting our workforce and providing those quality learning experiences? Well, actually, I, I may have my best answer to a question um, because there, there is already a group that has accomplished that task. Um, in fact, one of the things that came out of the Transforming the Workforce report was funding from the Institute of Medicine to help state teams develop action plans for their own states. And California is one of the states that has had this support. Um, and so um, I can talk with Stacy about giving you the information about how you get, much of their information is posted on the website, uh, but they have created a scenario for how this might, how some of the report's recommendations might uh, be implemented in California. 
Um, so one of the things that you also touched on was um, brain development and uh, ability to um, pick up um, the various languages and maybe yes. multiple at once during uh, this, this time frame, uh, particularly the first five years. Um, in, in California, with the passage of Prop 58, we're seeing uh, many opportunities where we can elevate the importance of dual language learners yes. um, and the importance of being a, a part of a competitive economy. Um, and looking at European countries, we see that our, our fellows there uh, have two to three plus languages under their belt. Uh, here in California, we won't go through the history of how we've perceived dual language. Um, and, and, and curious to hear from you, given the research that you've done, what recommendations do you have? And we've seen California already do some, some investments already for dual language learners, but curious to see if you have any thoughts on, um, on opportunities that we can uplift, uh, given what you know about the importance of this age group and uh, dual language learners and English language learners. Yeah. Well, there is no research that I know of <clears throat> that would stand in the way of supporting dual language learners. Um, and indeed, there's increasing research showing that, for example, on some measures of self-regulation, children who have been learning how to speak in more than one language are more advanced than, than, than single language learners. Um, part of the challenge in California is that we are a language-rich environment. And part of the challenge for children who are, um, have home languages um, that are not uh, matched in the personnel of a child care program or early education program that they're part of, there's nobody there, for example, who speaks Vietnamese, is getting support for their use of that language in the other setting in which they're spending much of their time. But I think that just reflects the richness of the language environment that we're in. And certainly encouraging those families who are native English speakers to see the early years as a rich opportunity for their children to expand their own language horizons uh, would certainly be warranted. Thank you. And I think for me, the, you know, again, going back to the workforce, because I think it's just all completely tied to the workforce, we're expecting our providers to be to be teaching our children early lang uh, other languages other than English. We're expecting to, expecting them to be um, having be knowledgeable on trauma informed care, yes. and we have so many expectations. But then, yet there's so much work that needs to happen to support our ECE workforce. Way too many expectations with very little resources. It just doesn't really make sense. And I would simply add to that that I think it's harder to be a really good teacher of a very young child than it is to be a college professor. Uh, any, any of us can stand in front of an auditorium and lecture students, especially if the students have to be there for their grade. Um, but right now at, at Zero to Three, I, I, I am the president of the board of directors of Zero to Three, a national nonprofit. We are heading up a national center on early childhood development, teaching, and learning. One of the things we're trying to think about is given everything we know about cognitive development in the first three years, how do you think about teaching a toddler? How do you think about um, uh, instruction? It certainly does not look like what you would do with a fifth grader. Nevertheless, there are wonderful strategies by which one can capitalize on the mental development that's going on to make this a learning opportunity. And that's not easy to pick up. Mm -hmm. So we are expecting even more of people working with the very youngest children. Thank you. We have one more question here, and then we will open it up for public comment. So if anyone uh, in the audience would like to um, either make a comment or ask a question, uh, please be prepared. After this next comment, we'll open it up for public comment. So mine is a comment, uh, and actually it, it sort of ties together um, Dean Marks's comments from earlier, plus your comments, Dr. Thompson, plus Kristen, your comments as well. Um, and I'm struck by the fact that uh, Dean Marks was talking about the pay rates for her uh, teachers here versus what the average pay was um, in the field. And I, for those people who know me, I always have a calculator to calculate things. Um, we would have to increase uh, pay rates somewhere between 30 and almost 50 percent 
to be comparable, to have the field be comparable to what Cerritos teachers are. And if we're really going to be serious about uh, having kinds of teachers who, and, and caregivers, I don't want to just say teachers, but brain architects, which would encompass everybody, uh, to be capable of doing that and, and recruit the kind of people that we would need, we would have to take the $4 billion that's currently being spent on ECE in California, and, and just that by itself would increase it to $6 billion. Mm. So I think that we have to be aspirational and really think about the fact that uh, we really need to invest a whole lot more in the zero to five footprint than we're currently investing. And it may take a couple of years to get there, but we have to set a goal much higher than what can we do with 500 million a year. We really have to th talk about somewhere around a nine or $10 billion expenditure rather than a $4 billion expenditure to get to the kind of outcomes that you're talking about. And I'm, I'm thinking that uh, when you look at the percentage that that $4 billion is out of a state budget, $4 billion out of $173 billion is 2%. $9 billion would be about 5%. So it's not like it's a big lift in terms of percentages to get there. And when you consider that in, in K-12 uh, and community colleges invest in investments in the Prop 98, we're spending 53% of all the dollars that the state currently gets. Nine billion seems like a small amount. So I would encourage all of us to be much more aspirational to, to try to really think about how do we find that other five, five or six billion dollars so that we can get the kind of results that you're talking about, Dr. Thompson. Yeah. So. Thank you very much. And uh, again, we'll go ahead and open it up to public comment if you would please come up. Thank you. Good morning. Um, first, I just really want to thank um, Speaker Rendon for creating the commission and holding up this important issue. And then I want to thank each of you because your volunteer service isn't easy and you're addressing a complicated issue with lots of cross currents and your time is probably your most precious resource. So I really want to thank each of you for the service you're giving uh, to California. Um, I'm Wendy Guerin. I'm the president and CEO of an endowed foundation in Los Angeles, the Ralph Parsons Foundation. Um, our giving is focused on the well-being of Los Angeles County. Um, I've become, I think, especially sensitized to this issue uh, because over the past two years I've been serving as commissioner in Los Angeles on the Children and Families Commission, which oversees the welfare of children who are the most at risk uh, and uh, connected to the child uh, welfare welfare system. Um, I also am the immediate ex uh, board chair of California uh, grant makers and um, in that capacity reflect private philanthropies, um, great willingness and interest. Packard was already mentioned, but you know there's a legion of private philanthropy that really wants to help impact this. I particularly am grateful for following Dr. Thompson's remarks because uh, the brain science has become something that is so astoundingly clear and the implications of it drive us, I think, to, to begin to take fresh looks at how we administer subsidy and serve the very most disadvantaged, very youngest of our children. So that's what I want to focus on in my two minutes. I want you I want to ask you to take your lens and focus on the neediest children. And I would say it's those children, birth to five, arguably birth to three, who have been removed from the homes of their birth parents because they are at risk or have been subject to severe abuse or neglect. These children clearly need, based on the brain science, access to high quality, trauma-informed, subsidized care. When they're re we know about the importance of these early years, and we know, you didn't mention the ACEs study today, but it's part of that triumvirate of research that you know we look at 17,000 people and we track them over their lifetimes and we find out uh, that these stressors in early childhood lead to you know, surprising results. Um, you know, uh, if you're rated on four of the ten, you know, you're, you're, you're far more likely to be an alcoholic, to have chronic uh, pulmonary disease, to have cancer. Uh, 
so the impact on society of not attending to the brain architecture and the uh, abuses of trauma uh, has these long time consequences for our culture. I suspect that many of the homeless people that we're looking at on the street have had really tough childhoods with mentally ill parents and you know trauma that has led them to n not be functional adults. So then we face, we know these kids are the most at risk. We have very limited resources that have been squashed, the 2% Dr. Alnick talked about. But we also know that when children are removed from their families by the state, that means us, that we are collectively now responsible for those children. And they are the state's responsibility, and I would say we are failing them these very young children. And we're failing them in a fairly grand way because we are not creating access for them to subsidized childcare. So uh, what I want to raise as an issue uh, during your very um, aggressive work plan, you've got lots of things to look at, but I note that your next up subject is access. Um, the brain science undergirds everything. And I'm here to ask the commission to try to help solve the problem of access to childcare subsidy dollars for young children who are first entering foster care. You know, we worry about how long kids stay in foster care. And the whole system is uh, predicated on reunification with birth families. We want that. We, we know that children want to be with their parents. We also are prioritizing placement in kin relationships, as opposed to the sort of um, negative word I heard, stranger care. Um, kin placements within family are more likely to lead to reunification. And what we know is uh, from DCFS and also, frankly, all the child welfare directors over the state of California, that we are facing extreme difficulty in finding suitable placement for zero to three because kin work. And we also have found that there are huge declines in the number of, of licensed whatever you want to call them, foster homes, resource fo homes. Um, and, and so we really literally don't have places to bring children to be placed. Um, what we know is that access to childcare is a barrier to placement for these very young children. Further, we know that these are the kids, I think based on Dr. Thompson's remarks, need the trauma-informed, high-quality remediation. They need the serve and return. They need to know life is regular and predictable. Um, we did, I, I want to thank um, everyone that was involved, some of who should be completely called out, including the, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, uh, the Child Welfare Association, um, uh, you know, everyone who held hands uh, to create the bridge to childcare, which is 31 million new dollars uh, for children in foster care to get access. It includes navigation and it includes support for providers speaking to the issue of um, their stress too. They're experiencing trauma too. But we're concerned that if we don't find out a way to prioritize these children, that we're in danger of this new money being a bridge to nowhere unless we change the administrative decision making that goes on around childcare subsidies. I would just close with, um, scarcity is tough because it forces us to triage. We, it, you know, ultimately our values are res reflected in how we spend money. What I'm talking about is childcare for working families. These foster families are working too, and they are impoverished too. And you've got a child that is already damaged. They're damaged because they've been removed from their birth parent, let alone what else they've seen in their community. A dead body on the street, drug abuse in the home, uh, a chaotic existence. So uh, what I understand is true is that I've heard that uh, there's an understanding that foster parents are paid enough that they should be able to handle these child care expenses. Uh, Unfortunately, there was written uh, testimony given when uh, the County Board of Supervisors asked the Assembly to clarify 
the administrative rules to state subsidy. And in opposing that clarification, the State Alternative Payments Organization threw out a figure of, uh, of foster families getting eight to 10000 a month to care for children, even if it was collectively that much money, which it isn't. It's about $800 a month for a child and uh, for the subsidy. And I look at personally, that is a stipend. Uh, anybody who lives in Los Angeles who has a spare bedroom, um, it, it, that's a miracle in and of itself, given our housing costs. And then, ch you know, child care costs on top of that. Can, can the money just really isn't there. And so um, the other thing that I'd heard is that, um, you know, all foster families aren't poor. Uh, well, that's certainly true. But I think in this uh, execution, we can prioritize on the youngest, the poorest, um, look at them as working families and provide them access to slots as they open up. Um, and it's not just the alternative payment slots, but we have to be creative. We need to dig into the administrative advocacy and unlock access for what I would argue is clearly the most uh, the, the most at-risk well, children. Well, and I think it's not just accesses. I think uh, um, you touched on the, the navigating through the whole system. I think it's part of the problem, but I think the commission is is uh, committed to working through some of those issues. I chair Human Services, which is in charge of foster care youth, and not only are those issues um, uh, coming up, but also the the notion that parent the foster parents are paid enough or that they're trained enough. The reason we don't have enough foster uh, parents is because the the qualification process is also very stringent. So I think that our job, and I think that's why uh, Speaker Rendon also put me on the commission, was because we need to work together. I, I don't see mm -hmm. that nexus between the uh, uh, foster care system and the education system to to address some of the issues that you're speaking about. So, yes, but I think we can create better outcomes. Yes. I mean, one of the questions would be to look at, um, you know, what's the vacancy rate? How many yes. time? How often are there vacancies? Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Uh, let me just add one thing. Um, we have to give big kudos to Susan Savage, who really poured a lot of work into addressing that very issue that you brought up. So it, it's in the works, but you're right. There's so much more that needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Conrado Guerrero, and I am president of SEIU Local 99. I'm also a building engineer for the Los Angeles Unified School District. I've been working there for 19 years. Beca before becoming president of our union, I was also a union steward, helping other members in our union use their voice to improve our workplaces and the services we provide to support student learning. I am proud to be with, to have with me today several of our union members who operate daycare centers out of their homes since forming their union with SEIU Local 99, several years ago, these members, mostly women of color, have brought a lot of energy to our union. Watching their commitment to lifting up their industry and their unity in the face of unprecedented state budget cuts has inspired me and many other longtime union members. In their homes, children learn to share, use their words, sit quietly in a circle, and they can play independently. They are polite, they can stand in line, and are creative. They have high vocabularies and, have, and many will be bilingual. Study after study shows that quality early learning like this increased success in school, lowers need for special education services, decreases the need for repeated grades, decreases truancy, increases the likelihood of attending college, and buying houses lowers the incarceration rate increases earnings and family stability, and decreases welfare dependency, crime, and teen pregnancy. They are strong advocates for children and families. They have successfully fought for restored funding to California child care systems. They have established an innovative new apprenticeship program that allows them access to college courses to move on in their careers, and they fill other training gaps in the state's child care system offering numerous workshops in, at our union hall, including how to identify special needs in early education and how to detect signs of child abuse and how to stay safe in this surprising dangerous field. 
where back injuries are too frequent and exposure to stresses and infectious diseases is high. And while, they, while, while the work they do is vital to our education system and our economy, these women have a unique challenge. Unlike all other members of SEIU Local 99, these ladies don't have right to collectively bargain with the state to improve their industry and working conditions. Although they know exactly what needs to be fixed in our broken child care system, they have no seat at the table when child care policy is made in California. Thank you. Providers in other states enjoy bargaining rights that have led to improve, important improvements in their state's child care system. After years of speaking out, California child care providers have started to take some small but important steps in child care. We want increased investment and updated parent eligibility guidelines that provide greater stability for children and parents. I'm encouraged that we are moving in the right direction to create a child care system that truly invests in our children and, is, and, is support, and supports our local 99 child care providers as they do this important work making sure children succeed K-12 through education and beyond. We will continue to push decision makers to take that important step will, that will truly make a difference in our state's services to its youngest learners. Give a voice to providers, invite them to the table. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you. There's about 20 people that uh, want to speak, so if I may ask to limit the comments to one minute so that we can hear everyone, otherwise we're gonna be here for another hour, please. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Deanna Coronado Robles, and I have been a family child care provider in Baum Park for 14 years. I'm a member of SEIU Local 99. I'm also a delegate and a health and safety trainer. I'm not just a provider. I'm also a Parks and Rec Commissioner in my city. Child care providers on the front lines every single day. We are here advocating to expand early learning and erase the lines that divide children by race, income level, and by zip code, even before they start school. We fight and advocate to give working women a chance to soar past the poverty line and give their kids a chance to achieve the American dream. We fight and advocate to make sure our workforce gets a seat at the table and voice in the system. For too long, we have lived under the poverty line in hardworking women like myself who are a critical part of the solution to state poverty crises. And at the, is why we are here today. This hearing is about finding solutions to fix our broken child care system. We are here on the right path. In the past year, we have won increases to outdated reimbursement rates and expanded access for families and children. If we want to keep on this path, we need to finally make a commitment to the dedicated workforce that makes this all possible, and finally secure collective bargaining rights for family child care providers in Southern California. Thank you. The benefits are enormous. Our child care system stands to benefit when we are able to bargain for improvements, such as increased access to training, more affordable for families, and streamlined payment and other processes to reduce high turnover amongst providers. Thank you. Thank you. Buenos días. Buenos días. Mi nombre es Catalina Delgado. He sido proveedora de cuidado infantil desde el 2000 hasta la fecha. De, de igual manera, pertenezco al local 99, el que ayuda a las proveedoras de cuidado infantil. Good morning, Catalina Delgado has been a provider since 2000 and is also a member of SCAU Local 99. Peleamos para expandir la educación temprana y borrar las líneas que dividen a los niños por raza, estatus económico, código postal, hasta que comiencen la escuela. Luchamos para que las mujeres trabajadoras tengan la oportunidad de sobresalir las líneas de pobreza y dar a sus niños la oportunidad de alcanzar el sueño americano. As uh, child care providers, we are here to support children as well as parents um, that are divided through economic as well as uh, political and uh, ethnic lines to ensure that their children get the best education possible. 
Luchamos para que nuestra fuerza laboral tenga un asiento en la mesa y una vez en el asiento que tenemos en el corazón. Por mucho tiempo hemos vivido bajo la línea de pobreza las mujeres trabajadoras, que son una parte crítica para solucionar la crisis de pobreza de este estado. And while we are fighting as childcare providers to have a seat in the table, uh, many of us are living under the poverty line. Estamos en el camino correcto. El último año hemos ganado incremento a las tarifas de reembolso de cuidado infantil y expandido el acceso para familias y sus niños. Si queremos continuar por el, este camino, necesitamos hacer un compromiso a la fuerza laboral que hace todo esto posible y finalmente asegurar el derecho a la negociación colectiva para proveedoras de cuidado infantil. And while we as providers have worked to ensure that we have a regional market rate increase, as well as increasing the eligibility for parents to receive subsidized child care, um, we are here asking um, the committee that we continue to fight for the right of providers to have collective bargaining in the state of California. Los beneficios inmensos son inmensos. Nuestro sistema de cuidado infantil se beneficia cuando podemos negociar mejor, mejorías como el incremento de acceso al entrenamiento, a la para el cuidado infantil para las familias. Gracias. With collective bargaining, our benefits uh, would be great, and also for a child care in the state of California, we, we, we would be able to see an increase in the regional market rates, as well as have um, other resources and be sitting in the table making decisions for child care providers in the state of California. Thank you. Thank you. Muchas gracias, señora. Good morning. My name is Betty Miller, and I have been a child care provider in Carson, California for 23 years. I'm also a member of SEIU Local 99. When I was in high school, I took part in a preschool training program and loved it so much that I went straight to El Camino College after graduating to earn a AA degree in early childhood education. I love working with children. They keep you laughing. They keep you on your move. It's a perfect it's perfect energetic for a person like me to work with children. For more than a decade, I have worked in child care centers, but I decided to open my own child care center in 1994. I want to create a comfortable, cozy home, away from home environment with good hot meals. We also have a very academic environment. A lot of music, dance, and creative activities is very, and very rich language for the children, giving them lots of love and praise. We have a magic circle that emphasizes sharing. The children learn caring, love, and respect. We go on a lot of field trips at my daycare. It's very multicultural with lots of races, Korean, Latinos, blacks, and white children. But it's not easy. There is a lot of support out there and we really need that voice from industries. We need a voice on, from licensing. We need a voice in our rates. We also need a voice in working with working agencies. The best way that voices can be heard loud and clear is collective bargaining. I joined the union because I was disappointed with the broken child care system in California that doesn't work for families and it doesn't work for the child care providers. Today I am here to support and ask for collective bargaining rights for children and I will continue to fight, push and pray to help children of California and children of all colors around the world. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Hello, committee. My name is Deborah Dow and I have been a, a family child care provider in Compton for 10 years. I'm also a member of the SEIU 99. Um, I come from a background of a multicultural family, so I do firsthand know of some of the poverty and some of the problems that go on in the home and being from, uh, like I've visited Mexico, I've seen the poverty there, being in Los Angeles, I've seen it there, and then when children come into my home, I intuitively know once I speak to their parents, there's something going on. So when they get an opportunity to be in a home environment that's different from theirs, they get to see that also other homes have life. 
in life more abundantly, that all homes are not broken. And so when they come in this environment, they see that there is care. People do care. Children are loved. They're not always abused and talked down to and treated badly just because one, like I have a son who was born in 2002. We didn't know he was autism early on, but he was different in the public schooling, so I had to take him out of the public schooling and find a different school for him. So I've noticed that child care has become a hot issue today. Political candidates are talking about it more. I hear about it on the news. Everyone seems to be talking about how expensive child care is and how family can't afford it. And that's correct. A lot of families can't afford it, so they get a program through Crystal Stairs, and I've also worked with DCFS for uh, children who are in the system, and they, they will allow uh, allotment for a certain amount of months until that mother gets herself either off drugs or reunified with her children. So Crystal Stairs is a program for women and some men who are on welfare system. So that does help, but this is more than just babysitting today. It is a job, a livelihood that we also have expenses and other things that we have to take care of ourselves. Thank and you. I think more people learning that providers are barely making it financially. The child care is under under resourced and that unless we pay attention to those of us providing the care as well as children and parents, we won't move forward. The crisis isn't new. But all this attention, it makes me hopeful that we're on the verge of a powerful movement in California and nationally. I'm here today to discuss what the path for it looks like and how child care workers can help lead us forward. There is a solution. And we've heard some of the answers to some of the questions that also give us solutions. I'm understand I'm sorry to interrupt, but we do have about 20 people okay, that still but, would like yeah, to speak. Okay. But again, like everyone else has stated, I'm here to uh, advocate for collective bargaining and having a seat at the table so that our voices can also be heard and then hopefully uh, later on it'll be more than a minute. Thank you very much. That. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sandra Moe and I also started as a family child care provider uh, but then I moved to centers and I was a teacher, an aide, a director in public and private, and now I participate in training the workforce. And so I wanted to address two issues that were brought up today. One that was introduced by Dean Marks about the closure of lab schools. And lab schools are a really important part of our workforce training. Um, I, ha I have been past president of a group of ECE professors called TRICE-ECE, -E, and we helped gather some of the data that Dean Marks was talking about, the closures of lab schools, and we had brought forward a proposal to increase the reimbursement rate for lab schools that receive state preschool funding to 1.5 because they do more than provide state preschool program, they train the workforce. And so um, I think that would be an important infrastructure, okay, uh, infrastructure element that Dr. Thompson talked about. And my second thing is that our infrastructure and the Wild West has to do with our licensing uh, entity in the Department of Social Services. They have not had a complete revision since 1984. And we really need to look at that because that is truly our infrastructure in, and part of why we have what keeps being said as a broken uh, childcare system. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning or good afternoon, wherever we're at. My name is Ernesto Saldana and I'm with the Advancement Project California. I work directly with families in Southeast Los Angeles, which as we all know, um, has some of the hardest hits regarding infants and toddlers and high quality preschool programs. Um, and I'm also a father of a dual language learner, um, a toddler, dual language toddler. <laughs> And um, I'm here to talk about um, the Every Student Succeeds Act and the opportunity that we have here as the Blue Ribbon Commission, as you all have as a Blue Ribbon Commission, to, to urge to have more ECE included in, in um, the SS state plan as it's being developed. Um, um, we were working with Californians together, an investment project put together a policy brief that I actually put in, in front on the table over there that folks can grab. We urge um, the commission to, to continue to urge to see ECE to be 
included more substantively in the plan as we continue to create alignment between early child education and the K-12 system, as well as supporting our dual language learners throughout. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Cliff Markison. I'm the Executive Director of Options for Learning here in LA County. I'm here to address the key factor that the committee must address if you want to expand infant and toddler child care centers. There is one key factor that in the education code that is responsible for the fact that virtually all of our infant toddler centers that are, were funded 20, 30 years ago with solely state funds have closed and that is blocking the opening of any new infant and toddler centers funded solely with state funds. That factor in the law is called the infant adjustment factor and the toddler adjustment factor. There's one for infants and one for toddlers. That factor is key to the reimbursement levels received by center-based infant toddler programs and it is grossly inadequate. In 1994, the California Child Development Administrators Association that one of your members now leads car car carried legislation. I have a copy of it. It didn't make it through in its original form. It was based on an actual study that documented what those factors needed to be to support. If you want to expand those centers, this is the key issue that the legislature must deal with because it's in the Ed Code. I have a copy of the study from 1994. I would be happy to work with the committee on updating that study and work with the committee on solving this if you want to move on this issue. Thank and you. I will Thanks. pass these copies to Nina to share with the rest of you. Thank you. Good morning, Assemblymember, Commissioners, Distinguished Speakers. I just want to start by thanking you for the time and attention you're bringing to the world of early care and education. It is so appreciated. Um, I'm Becca Patton from First 5 LA. Previously, you've heard from my colleague Aaron at First 5 California. Today, we also here have First 5 Riverside and First 5 San Bernardino. I just really want to reiterate our commitment to supporting and informing your work as you continue over the next year and a half. Keep it very short and sweet today. I just have a few key principles that I want to lift up as you do your work. One is that we protect and enhance the mixed delivery system for children so that availability of early care and education is responsive to both child and parent need. That we protect and maximize early transitional kindergarten and transitional kindergartners' ability to remain a part of ADA earning. That we enhance the quality of education for all children, which will necessitate adequate per-child funding clearly articulate the coordination, collaboration, and alignment needed of our early care and education system with K through 12, create pathways that support and encourage participation in the ECE workforce, and finally, to really prioritize our most vulnerable children in need of early care and education, lifting us up as a solution for the opportunity gap. So thank you again for your time, and just know that first five commissions throughout the state of California are here and willing to participate and engage in your work. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, my name is Yvonne Swires with First Five Riverside, and I'm gonna take my minute to pick your interest and provide a snapshot of the work that's going on in Riverside County. So I'm gonna talk very quickly, but we do have a couple of handouts that provides the details. So First Five has um, set aside our largest investment to support a subsidized re reimbursement and quality incentive program for low-income children zero to five years of age to access early learning education in quality settings. What's different about our investment in, is the approach and delivery system. It builds on past early investments through a systems approach and aligns with and supplements an existing uh, Riverside County of Education alternative payment program. Our RAP funding fills the gap for participants that are not eligible for other subsidized programs. Additionally, the RAP links to our Quality Start, and so we provide centers with training, stipends, tiered incentives, and coaching to support and increase quality in our centers. So together, our Quality Start Riverside County and RAP provide access and quality to early learning environments. We just completed our first year of the program, so we have a handout that shows the numbers and kids that we're touching. We also did a survey with parents, okay, and we, we actually had 21 parents who responded. So those are key findings and factors that, that contribute to their decision making. There's a huge gap, and so we ask that you support our, our work as well. All right, thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, Roberto Viramontes with the Learning Policy Institute. I want to thank the speaker's office, the commission, and the panelists for coming here today. Much appreciated are the topics on uh, early brain development and why investments in EC are necessary. Uh, as you know, the Learning Policy Institute recently released a report on landscape uh, of VC programs in California. It provides a comprehensive overview of the state system, describing its administration and funding, access to care, uh, program quality, and data limitations in the state of California. Our report also outlines questions for consideration for the Blue Ribbon Commission as you work to improve the system here in our state. For example, how can California move toward from a patchwork of disconnected programs to a more unified EC system? A unified system that is accessible to the families that need it most, uh, continually raises quality, and is financially sustainable. We'd be glad to work with the Commission in helping address those questions, especially since we are now conducting county and local interviews to eliminate issues encountered at the local level. In, in, for example, variation in EC programming across state, promising practices, quality reviews, funding eligibility determinations. Uh, we've circulated copies uh, of the landscape report to commissioners, and we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Stacey Lee, and I'm with Children Now. We're a research policy and advocacy organization based in California, and I'm very excited that you all here are, are here in LA. We appreciate your time for those who had to travel. Um, I really appreciate the presentation and the focus on brain development. Um, Children Now released a report earlier this year called Starting Now, um, talking about what California needs to do around policy um, in families, early education, um, health, and in communities, because we know it's not a simple uh, solution to ensure that all of these children are, are supported and prepared to be able to reach their full potential. Um, and I just want to echo some of the comments made by some of the commissioners and panelists that we really take this opportunity to think um, big and then get practical about what it would take to make California um, invest appropriately in what we know now. Um, I think uh, Dr. Thompson made a, a really smart remark in terms, oh, a lot of smart remarks, but um, about this, this being different from 10 years ago. We know more than we did then, and we need to think differently um, than we did then. And I, and I really encourage the commissioners to be ambitious and think comprehensively about how we support our young kids. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Christina Negrelli and I'm joined by my colleagues Jennifer Chacon and Will Portillo. We are here on behalf of the nearly one and a half million infants and toddlers in California and our organization Zero to Three. Our mission is to ensure that all babies and toddlers have a strong start in life. Um, our California babies and toddlers need not only access to high quality affordable early care and education programs, but as well as high quality health and mental health and family support services. Programs and services that address these areas are critical. However, they are only as strong as the infrastructure that supports them. California needs a comprehensive, coordinated, well-funded system of high-quality prenatal to age eight services that foster success in school and in life. Um, recent research informs us that there are nearly one million new neural connections that are formed every second early on in a baby's life. Therefore, California needs to invest in the bedrock of brain connections by promoting mental health of uh, families and babies and toddlers and expand communities' capacity um, and support young uh, brain development through early care and learning programs and child welfare. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, Elsa Jacobson with Los Angeles Universal Preschool, also affectionately known as LAF. And um, it struck me as I was listening to the comments um, that as we all know, families are, are critical, perhaps the most critical partners in early education. And so uh, we would urge the commission to think about and to consider and to research approaches and programs that have supported families in reducing stress at home and helping them engage with their children's learning. I know Dr. Thompson mentioned um, the family, the home visiting program, um, certainly one successful program, but, um, but we urge you to consider others that might might be out there um, because we know that, that families, uh, we don't want them to be overlooked when they are the most critical partner um, in this business. And um, I would also mention that LAF has done quite a bit of work with family engagement, so we're more than happy to be a sounding board um, as you do this work. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tony Isaacs. I'm the uh, program director for PEACH. We're a collaborative of uh, faculty from institutions of higher education. We have faculty from 25 institutions in LA County and 15 in the Sacramento and Bay Area. And we want to thank the work of the commission 
and we want to say that you know we're really trying to help support the growth of the workforce um, through professional development and higher education pathways and some of the areas that we're focusing on is the revision of the child development permit um, advocating for an ECE credential, which I'm glad to hear um, some comments about that today. Um, also really looking at the importance of high quality practicum experiences for our students because we know that's vital and a big part of that also is having high quality lab schools and making sure that those lab schools stay in existence because they're a critical um, component. Um, the other thing we're really advocating for is a doctoral program. As many of you may know, there's only one doctoral program in, that focuses specifically on early childhood education in California. And um, we look forward to sharing uh, the work of this commission and supporting it in any way we can. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Julie Cates and I participate in um, a number of uh, coalitions that are to expand access to quality early education and early care. Um, I have three sets of remarks. First of all, I'm here today as for the League of Women Voters California as their early child care um, education representative. And we were very strongly in support of AB 60 and we're so pleased that our legislators and our governor have advanced pro you know, policies to improve eligibility periods and reimbursement rates. Good progress there. Um, second, um, because not enough is being done at the state level, particularly in funding, many of us are working hard at the county level. And I really want to invite you know, all, all you commissioners to come to uh, Santa Clara County and uh, San, San Mateo County and learn what we are doing locally uh, with good learnings that then can be applied to the state. So first of all, San Mateo County, I'm on the, the child care. Uh, yeah, definitely. Okay. And then second, um, applaud Michael's um, goal to be more aspirational. Many of us in Silicon Valley would like to work with any of the commissioners on how can we be more aspirational in going for larger budgets for early educate, child education. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I, my name is Dion. Um, I'm a representative of Local 99 SEIU. Um, I am a safety and healthy coach and trainer. Um, I have uh, worked alongside with my mother in a child care facility uh, for about 15 years. Um, and um, pretty much I had a, a question for Mr. Thompson um, about education, I mean about technology and the, the younger uh, kids and their growing. Um, I, I'm starting to see that the kids are starting to uh, learn things way more faster than the average kid and um, f when their when the technology was low. How, the, how does that plays an effect on the kids uh, mental capacity f for the future and um, how does it plays a, a factor on their um, cognitive development? Um, pretty that's that's that was one. And um, another thing is that um, I don't know if there's a funding for this, but um, meditation works. <laughs> it works it, uh, for the brain. These kids, you know, they they come in into our facility under stress, really bad. Mother in really stressful mindset. And when I implement just natural things like meditation and and one on one with these kids, then you know. I see a, a great outcome, so um, that's about it, pretty much it. Thank this is my you. first time. Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. I'm, I'm Ray Burnell. I'm the Education Director for the Catholic Church in California, and we've been honored for the last three budgets to partner with many of the groups up here in advocating for the reinvestment in early childhood education and we'll continue to do that wholeheartedly. Two policy considerations we can elaborate later, later on uh, as we, we go forward is to really continue to explore new and creative public-private partnerships. You know, we have a, a mixed delivery system of public and private providers. We have to come up with creative ways of supporting both and making sure that they're there. Not just added state appropriations, but the creative use of tax policy and increasing philanthropy. The second part is really to unite the work of the legislature that's being done right now. We have this blue ribbon task force. 
We have a select committee in the assembly dealing with nonprofits. And we also have AB 1520, which is looking to end childhood poverty, which is going to put together a task force to come up with a plan that's going to eliminate uh, deep poverty and reduce or cut in half poverty in the next 20 years. These are three critical great groups that really need to work together, and we're committed to work with you. Thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I'm here with my son, and I'm... Um, been in the field for over 20 years. I've worked with many of the agencies that are here in the past. Um, I'm a mother as well. Um, but one thing I would really like for you guys to um, invest in or look at is definitely getting care for these little ones. Because three to five, there's ch lots of options, but zero to three, there isn't much. Um, and then most importantly is the field, the profession. Um, Sorry, reimbursements, and I know that for K through 12 teachers, there's always loan forgiveness, but early education field, we really need that because I see so many of my colleagues who are able to qualify because the pay is so low and they have families to support and there isn't any forgiveness situations for them. So unfortunately, I've seen a lot of professions leave the ECE to go to K through 12, and that's a huge loss for our field. So thank you. Thank you. You right? Yes. Thank you very much for, for the discussion. Um, the one thing that I heard was we need more money, and I think we're all uh, in agreement uh, with, with that. Uh, but the other, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> more money, more money, more money. Um, but in lieu of that, I heard from uh, a lot of the comments that very, very diverse ideas about how we can tackle some of these issues. And for those of you that spoke or, or wanted to speak, if you could, please send us the information. I, our hopes for the commission is that we're not just here to listen and kind of move on uh, uh, along and you know go on our way. We really want to implement some um, sound policies or some sound ideas so that we can tackle the issues. So what I would like to ask is if you could send some of your comments and ideas. Um, Liz, Liz, would it be appropriate for them to send them to you or to M McCarty's Oh, Stacy, Stacy, um, if you can give your information out, I really would like to compile the ideas that were presented today so that we can look at them. Um, again, I don't want this to be just something that we attended and you attended and we moved on. This is a working group and we're committed to really implementing some of your ideas. So if you can uh, forward that information to Stacy, I really would appreciate that. And uh, for the second uh, uh, item, we will be uh, definitely in, uh, building in more uh, public comment uh, time into our next meeting. It's really important that we hear from you, but uh, due to the lack of time, I didn't want to limit to just one minute, but we unfortunately had to do that. But we will uh, uh, build in more public comment time on our next meeting. But I want to thank uh, first of all, the trustees, the staff, and the community at Cerritos College for hosting us. This is such an important issue that I think needs to, to, to be held more often, but I really appreciate their, their hosting us. Also, um, thank the commissioners, really, for your time and dedication to this commission. Um, uh, the speaker really was purposeful in selecting the commissioners so that we are, again, here as a working group. So thank you very much for your participation, and we look forward to having more uh, meetings like this. Um, and also to, to the public that attended, we really appreciate the input. And again, uh, I have j I'm a new member of the State Assembly. I've only been there for seven months, and I hear a lot of discussion, but I see a little action and that is really frustrating to me and I know that it's frustrating to you so again the hopes of the Commission is that we not only hear you but we actually implement some some ideas that will uh, uh, help us in closing the 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 budget gap but the achievement gap between the, the lower income communities and I think that you're we're right on that the zero to five community is the ones that need to be addressed first so that we can make long-term investments in California's children. So thank you again for your participation. Um, Stacy is here uh, with her information, forward that information. Uh, any ideas that we can uh, sit down as a working group and we really appreciate your time and again thank you for your time for being here. Thank you.